Hi everybody, welcome to our next lecture in our series on momentum. And I want to look at a particular scenario here. What I've got here is two objects of different mass, and I don't really know what they are. And the object on the left is moving initially to the right with some sort of velocity. And the object on the right is moving straight at it, also initially with some sort of velocity. They hit each other at this point and bounce off each other. So this one, first one ends up moving the opposite direction to the left with some final velocity. And the other one bounces the other way, also with some final velocity. Now, this point of impact, I sort of want to look at what's going on here. Well, we know that when two objects come in contact with each other, they must apply a force. And according to Newton's third law of motion, action-reaction, the force that one applies to two has to be equal but opposite to the force that two applies to one. Okay, action-reaction. Now, of course, we also know when things make contact, they're not allowed to touch each other for different times. So the force that they apply to each other has to occur over the same time period. Now, if you remember from our last lecture, force times time, well, that's actually the idea of impulse. So in addition to forces being equal and opposite, the impulse that they apply to each other are equal and opposite. Now, the other thing we learned from our last lecture is the impulse momentum theorem. And that is that any impulse is equal to a change in momentum. So now that also means that the change in momentum that occurs to the first one must be equal and opposite to the change in momentum of the second one. So action reaction is telling us a lot of things. Forces are equal and opposite, impulses are equal and opposite, and change in momentum are equal and opposite. But let's expand this out a little bit farther. Change in momentum. Well, that's change in mass times velocity and change in mass times velocity. Now, in each case, the masses didn't change. So I'm going to sort of pull that out. And on this side, we've got mass times change in velocity. And over here, the negative of mass times change in its velocity. Change in velocity, final minus initial. So mass, P final, minus initial. Mass, P final, minus initial. And now I'll do one of your favorite little mathematical things by distributing through. So I'll multiply through by m everywhere. So here I have m1 v final minus m1 v initial. Over here I have negative m2 v final. Now negative times negative is a positive, so this gives me plus m2 v initial. Now I'm going to do something that might seem a little bit odd. I want to combine the initial terms together on one side. In other words, deal with the entire beginning on one side, and then the final terms on the other side. In other words, deal with the entire final situation on the other side. So that means I need to move the initial over here and this final over here. Well, the negatives on the initial and the negative on the final on each side means I've got to add in both sides. So what I'll end up with is something like this. M1 V1 final plus M2 V2 final equals M1 V1 initial plus M2 V2 initial. Now let's look a little more closely at what this says. This says if I add together the momentum of the first and the momentum of the second after something happened, it equals when I add together the momentum of the first plus the momentum of the second before something happens. When I add something together, that sounds like a total, doesn't it? So this seems to say that the total momentum of the two objects at the end is equal to the total momentum of the two objects at the beginning. That sounds like totals are constant. Now, we kind of learned back before that whenever we hear total and constant, that must mean something. Must mean a conservation law. 
and this is called the law of conservation of momentum. And it says, the total momentum of an isolated system of interacting objects remains constant if no external forces act on the system. In other words, total momentum before something happens and total momentum after something happens is constant as long as we don't bring in any other forces. So for example, these two things hit, but if at the same time they hit, I swung a hammer in there, that would be adding an external force. So we're just considering them together. And so we get this kind of long equation, but it's not really an equation, it's just all about momentum. So as I add up momentum at the beginning, and I add up momentum at the end, and I end up with the exact same number on each side. So let's look at an example of that and see if it really works. So what I've got here is this object on the left, okay, that has a mass of 2 kilograms, and a, it'll have an initial velocity of 4 meters per second, thus giving it a momentum of 8 kilogram meters per second, or 8 newton seconds. The one on the right has a mass of 5 kilograms, is going to be traveling at negative 2 meters per second, the other direction, and thus has a momentum of negative 10. So now, if I consider the total momentum of the system, in other words, I add these together, I end up with a total momentum of negative 2. Down here, this shows the idea of momentum. The momentum of this one is to the right, the momentum of this one is to the left, but the total momentum is to the left, negative 2. So let's run this. So they come at, they hit, and move back the other way. Now notice, after the collision, the masses are still the same, but the velocities have changed. But now the momentum of this one has become negative 7, and the momentum of this one positive 5. Well, if I add that together, I still get a momentum of negative 2. And notice that total momentum arrow is still the same, negative 2. So I have to consider the whole system. So clearly, momentum is conserved. Now one of the big areas that we tend to see conservation momentum is under the principle of something called a recoil. Whenever some sort of gun, cannon, howitzer, whatever is fired, it always kicks back. It always recoils. And there's a real physical and mathematical reason why. Because the gun and whatever it's shooting have to conserve momentum in the process. Now in the shot, the projectile goes forward but that causes the gun to recoil backwards. Okay? And it really has everything to do with action-reaction. So in the end, the law of conservation of momentum is actually really Newton's third law, action-reaction. Let's look at an example. Here I have a gun, and the mass of the gun is 3 kilograms, but it holds a 2-gram bullet. Now, of course, we're going to need to convert that right away, to 0 0.002 kilograms for the bullet. The gun is fired and the bullet is going to leave the gun at 80 meters per second. And what we're looking for is, well, how fast does the gun kick back? Now hopefully it better not be 80 meters per second or that's pretty much going to kill whoever's holding the gun. So whenever things are going to recoil, we always want to apply the law of conservation of momentum. It says that M1 V1 O plus M2 V2O equals M1 V1F plus M2 V2F. Now, um, what I've done, or I like to do, is this equal sign. I tend to call this equal sign the point of interaction. In other words, this is the point at which something happens between the two objects. So whatever is on the left occurs the moment before that interaction. Whatever is on the right occurs the moment after that interaction. Okay? So on the left is before things happen, and on the right is after things happen. So let's look at the scenario. Well, the point of interaction is pulling the trigger, okay? So before the trigger is pulled, what's the gun doing? Nothing. And what's the bullet doing? Nothing. So what that means is that the total momentum of the system, the gun and the bullet, before anything happens, is zero. Now, that means that the total momentum at the end has to also be zero, 
but there's going to be velocities at the end. But remember, velocity and momentum are vectors. So where one will go forward, that means the other must go backwards. Let's look at that. So after the shot is fired, the bullet, which has a mass 0.02 kilograms, takes off at 80 meters per second. The gun, which has a mass of 3 kilograms, has some velocity we don't know. So what that says is 0 is equal to 0.16. Now, I subtract and divide by 3, and I get a recoil speed of the gun of negative 0.053 meters per second. Now, there's two very important things that make sense about this answer. First of all, it's negative, indicating that the gun must have kicked backwards. But it's also a very low velocity, okay, which makes sense because the gun is much bigger in mass. So if you think about it, with the ideas of action, reaction, momentum, forces, things like that, the forces are equal and opposite, right? But if the forces are equal and opposite, and one has a very small mass, and the other has a very large mass, well, one of them has to have a very large acceleration and the other a very small acceleration. How do we find acceleration? Change in velocity over time. So that also means, with the idea of momentum, that if one has a little mass but a big velocity, the other one has to have big mass and little velocity. So it all sort of makes sense. Let's look at one other example of recoil and something a little more involved. Now, this is not a washing machine, as it somewhat looks. Uh, let's say it's the hatch in a space station. And you're working in your space station, and you decide to go out to do a repair job on a satellite. And of course, you've got your handy toolbox that you're cruising along with. Well, you get about 40 meters away from your spaceship, kind of stop there to look around, and suddenly your little jetpack no longer works. Okay? And you're not tethered to the ship, because astronauts now use these specialized jetpacks to move around. So how are you going to get back? Well, luckily you brought your handy toolbox. You think to yourself, well, maybe if I just throw my toolbox this way, I should start recoiling back towards the spaceship the other way. But the question would be, how much time is it going to take you to get back to the spaceship? All right, well, we need some other numbers. Let's say that your mass, fully suited up, is about 120 kilograms with all your equipment on, stuff like that. And let's say the toolbox mass is about 2 kilograms. All the tools and things like that. In it. Applying conservation momentum, M1V1O plus M2V2O equals M1V1F plus M2V2F. Now, you were both, you and the toolbox were sitting there at rest. So before the point of interaction, before you threw the toolbox, everything was at rest. Let's say you throw the toolbox at 5 meters per second. So the toolbox takes off at 5 meters per second. You will recoil at some value. Okay, well, it's 10. Subtract 10 and divide by 120. And you get negative 0.083 meters per second. Yeah, which means you're not going to be moving very fast. Now, that doesn't answer my time question, though. Well, here's the tricky part. And here's where students often make a mistake. They'll think, OK, one thing I know is I've got a displacement of not 40 meters, but negative 40 meters, because I'm going to be going backwards 40 meters. And what people will often try to do is to figure out an acceleration. 
Well, the acceleration actually occurred here during the change in momentum. Once you have pushed off or thrown that box, now remember you're in space. Once you've done that push, you can't accelerate after that. So now you're going to float backwards at a constant velocity because there's no other forces being applied once you pushed off that toolbox. So we have to keep it in mind, and this is so important, that during the floating process our acceleration is zero. Don't try to calculate an acceleration. Now knowing that, I'm going to go all the way back to my motion equations, my displacement equations. I know I'm going to float 40 meters backwards. Now, initial velocity. Well, the final velocity at which I left the toolbox now becomes the initial velocity of my ability to float. They're the same number. Negative 0.083. No acceleration. And now I can solve for time. And that gives me about 481.9 seconds. Okay, so it's going to take several minutes for you to get back there, but it's better than being stuck out in space all this time. So that's basically how the law of conservation of momentum works. The total momentum of two or more interacting objects before something happens equals the total momentum of these objects after something happens. In recoil, the reason things always recoil is because you must conserve momentum. Now that doesn't mean you conserve energy. We'll get to that a little bit later. But you always conserve momentum. All right, that'll do it for today. See you next time.